My name is uh, Kai Fu Lin. Uh, I have been working on artificial intelligence for almost 40 years, starting from college. Uh, artificial intelligence is the practice which tries to learn what we humans do and have as intelligence. But AI is very different from human intelligence. The AI today is, on the one hand, is very capable with a large amount of data it can learn to make decisions better than people in single domains. But it cannot have any complexity, creativity, or self-awareness, or compassion as humans. So on an economic side, it's a tremendous opportunity to use AI for almost every industrial uh, application and really dramatically improve the efficacy, reduce the costs, and create value, and even disrupt many industries. So it's a very exciting time for people to, to put AI as a part of industries and companies and applications. In many ways, it is like electricity or like the internet. That is the power of artificial intelligence. Uh, at the same time, any new technology will also bring up some concerns about privacy, security, wealth inequality, job displacements. So I'm here to um, interact with the group, see what questions you have about artificial intelligence, and uh, hopefully uh, I'm able to help you see that AI is the new electricity. It will change the world. There are many issues, but we can and will overcome them. So, any questions from the audience, please? Hola, señor Lee. Soy estudiante de segundo bachillerato y bueno, sabemos que cuando se habla de inteligencia artificial se utilizan dos términos, como machine learning y deep learning. ¿Podría explicarnos en qué consisten? Uh, certainly. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, has been around since the 1950s and it encompasses many, many kinds of um, technologies. Uh, starting from understanding of the human brain uh, to our cognitive process to using uh, statistics and uh, advanced computer technologies to make decisions and, and uh, even emulate human uh, capabilities uh, from uh, decision making, prediction, classification, uh, all the way to uh, approaching human intelligence. So it's a very large discipline. Uh, the only area in this large discipline that has worked is the machine learning aspect. And within machine learning, deep learning is the single technology that has worked the best. So machine learning means when we take a large amount of data and then we teach it what the right answer is and eventually it becomes better than us on the right answer. So examples might include uh, Amazon teaches uh, its AI what people buy what each individual buys, and then it learns for each person what you're most likely to buy and show you that merchandise to maximize its revenue. So these capabilities uh, will be aggregated in machine learning, data as input, decisions or classifications or predictions as output. Deep learning is the most um, advanced and uh, exciting technology within machine learning, because you can imagine to have a machine learning system that can learn from data, uh, you can use many, many different computer algorithms. Deep learning chooses to use a very deep network that is modeled after the human brain, but very, very deep, thousands of layers deep, so that uh, information comes in, uh, decisions come out. And the depth of the network makes it possible for the computer to have abstractions. So, Humans might say, uh, to give a loan, we should look at the person's trustworthiness. And the trustworthiness depends on their past behavior on borrowing and spending, and also depends on whether the person looks trustworthy, and depends on whether they lived in the place for a long time. But these are called features. Uh, but for deep learning to work, you actually don't need to teach it any features. You show it enough data, and the machine will decide what are the, re, the re, what are the components that makes a trustworthy borrower and what are the components that make a less trustworthy borrower and make its own decision. So um, one could say that a deep learning essentially learns from a blank slate or tabula rosa and that input comes in and uh, you don't teach it how to think, you don't teach it what to think, you just tell it think whatever way you want to get me the outcome. 
And the outcome for Amazon is most sales. The outcome for a bank is least defaults. Uh, the outcome for speech recognition is the greatest word accuracy. So machine learning in general learns based on large quantities of data to make classification decision or prediction. And deep learning is a very special form of machine learning that essentially makes a very complex deep network, therefore requiring a lot of data. And it can make decisions uh, more accurately than people when you have an overwhelming amount of data from which it can learn everything. Buenos días, señor Lee. Yo soy profesor. Me gustaría saber cómo puede ayudar la inteligencia artificial en mi labor diaria, por ejemplo, a mis alumnos o a mí. Muchas gracias. Uh, I think there are uh, near-term and long-term ways in which AI can help. In terms of the near-term ways, if we decompose a teacher's job, um, many parts can be done better with AI, and some parts can be done only with the teacher. So if you think about learning in general, it would include components such as in-classroom lectures, uh, at-home practice, uh, exams, and also tutoring as the general four areas when we think about education. Uh, in terms of in-class lecturing, uh, if you're a great teacher, the human should continue to do that. Uh, it can be helped maybe by MOOCs or online lecture by famous people. Uh, in terms of homework, actually the AI can give a different homework assignment to each student by understanding the student's strengths and weaknesses. So for example, maybe one student has trouble with multiplication. So now you're teaching division. So that student should continue to get his, his or her own in, uh, multiplication drill questions because you can't learn division without learning multiplication. But another student may be so advanced that you want to give more advanced homework. And all of that can be based on observations uh, of each student's uh, homework, tests, grade, exam, aptitude, aspiration, uh, as well as things that the teacher observes, as well as the things that artificial intelligence observes. So the homework should be different for every student. Uh, just like when we go to uh, Amazon, every one of us sees a different page. When we go to Facebook, every one of us sees a different page. So education needs to adopt this notion of optimizing to have a different, better optimized result for each child. We can also teach our kids with AI and practices and homework um, by optimizing each student's um, actual understanding of the subject whether it's math or English. So you train the AI system to give each student the right learning homework incentives, tests, so such that the child will have the highest score in each category. So it's uh, customized, it's targeted, just like an Amazon or Facebook can do. Uh, exams, similarly, ought to be um, customized, targeted, automatically selected uh, in the same way as homework. And grading of the homework and exam. I think teachers spend much too much time grading homework and exams. Actually, in China, the AI technologies are very advanced in education. So most teachers in most schools no longer grade exams. The exams are still written in Chinese schools on paper, but AI will uh, OCR scan the exam uh, converted into texts or formulas. And even for uh, mathematics and the chemistry, the AI can understand mathematical proofs and um, uh, chemistry formulas and automatically grade it. So why should teachers waste time grading homework when AI can do a good job? The only homeworks a, um, or exams teachers have to grade are probably uh, essay questions, um, uh, composition that are a little more complex. Almost everything else, the AI can do, saving the teacher a lot of time. Um, and then in tutoring, um, uh, we actually fund a company called VIP Kid in China. Uh, it is teaching um, 8,000 Chinese kids to be perfectly fluent in English. Um, it's currently mostly using uh, video conference, remote teaching. It's like Uber, matching the American teachers for English to the Chinese students. 
But we're learning that in the one-on-one -on -one tutoring, while very effective with humans, you can actually do a reasonable job with a virtually generated teacher. So you can generate a teacher who is perfect for early entry level teaching for maybe the first one year. After one year, you need to have conversations. You really need a human. So that can actually bring down the costs and actually do better than humans. So we see a lot of near term opportunities where uh, if you break down the teacher's job into many tasks, there are some jobs, some tasks that AI can do better. There are some that AI can help the teacher. Uh, but in, in aggregate, when you adopt all the AI in education with today's classroom setting, uh, probably 40 to 50% of the teacher's time is freed. That time, I think, should go into person-to-person -person connection so that the teacher can spend more time on the moral compass and values and uh, teamwork and compassion and creativity aspects of each individual. That, I think, is the future of education. So if we think about how education has developed, it is actually incredibly backwards for the entire humanity. If we think for a moment, today's transportation versus 100 years ago. So have a mental image, visual image. What, is, what does transportation look like today, right? With uh, trains and um, uh, cars and highways and Uber compared to 100 years ago, uh, still with uh, just transitioning to early stage automobiles, no highways and so on. Think about how entertainment has changed today with Netflix and YouTube and online video and interactivity and uh, <clears throat> KOLs um, and, uh, and movies funded by Netflix compared with 100 years ago. You know, still black and white and even silent movies changed dramatically. And furthermore, think about how work has changed uh, 100 years ago from today. Have your mental image of everything that we do every day, right? Um, our entertainment, communications, social, um, transportation, uh, and work, all dramatically changed. But think about our mental image of a classroom, exactly the same. You still have a teacher lecturing the same way to 20, 30, 50 kids sitting there in desks. Even the desks look the same. Even the teacher is the same. You may change from a blackboard to a whiteboard, but the teacher is still teaching the same way. And that cannot be right. Technology has uh, completely revolutionized everything, how we uh, live, play, learn, work, communicate. It has not made the impact to education. And we need to really rethink what the future of education needs to be. If we think about the skill set, artificial intelligence will take away the routine jobs. Yet most of the education in most countries are still teaching each child to be the same robotic, test-taking, high-scoring robot. And children or students will never beat AI in memorizing, studying, conceptualizing, multiple choice, doing math equations, doing uh, chemical equations and formulas, uh, and remembering history. It will never beat AI. So we're teaching children all the wrong things. I think education needs to be rebooted, restarted. Education for the future of the children needs to focus on what, on what humans need to be. Not teaching kids to be AI, but teaching kids to do things AI cannot do. It needs to have a much bigger component on the three C's. When I, when I say three C's, I mean curiosity, critical thinking, and creativity. It needs to have much bigger component on teamwork, communication, collaboration, rather than doing each homework individually, doing tests individually, competing against each other on grades. That's the wrong way. As we know in companies today, it's about teamwork, it's about collaboration, it's about communication. That's what we need to teach. We need to teach love and empathy and how to win trust. Those are things that need to be added. Uh, yes, there still needs to be learning of the basic skill sets, math and language and so on, but those are, are just foundational elements. That's more the foundation, not the main substance. Um, so unless we make a big change to education uh, and change education from training repetitive routine robots 
into training creative, compassionate humans. If we don't make that transition, the future will be very bleak because the graduates of college will be unable to take the tasks and jobs that in 15 or 20 years that we humans will need to have. There will be a huge mismatch. We will have graduates who still want to be office workers and number crunchers and um, are, uh, fi uh, and filers and writers and editors of routine basic content. We're going to need graduates of college to become critical thinkers, creatives, strategic thinkers, and compassionate and empathetic people. So the gap in education is huge from where we are and wh where we need to be. And education is one of the slowest moving um, institutions that has been the slowest in adopting technology. And unless that changes, uh, 30, 50 years from now, we're headed for a very, very terrible, bleak future. Buenos días, Dr. Lee. Eh, soy María y soy profesora de instituto. Y tengo en el aula varios alumnos con discapacidades eh, motoras e intelectuales. Quisiera saber cómo la inteligencia artificial eh, puede ayudar a estos alumnos. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think, uh, depending on the type of disabilities, uh, AI can do either a lot or maybe only a little. Um, in in ma many of the cases where the students' disabilities are based on our, uh, learning disabilities and um, uh, autism and um, Asperger's, those types of um, uh, special aspects of the people, um, I, th I think currently humans are the best way to help these people um, because many of these learning disabilities require greater attention and only a human can do that. So I think AI may be able to help a little bit, for example, in the, dis in the discovery and uh, diagnosis of someone who might need the human touch. Because obviously, if we have a large number of people with learning disabilities and um, assigning each person a dedicated teacher can be very expensive. So uh, accurate diagnosis is important. Uh, it's possible that uh, the teacher, the mentor can spend time with the student on, on these uh, disabilities, but when they go home, uh, the, the parents are not professionals. There might be, uh, one could imagine, a, a companion, an AI companion, uh, who can be the right kind of, provide the right kind of companionship and encouragement and, um, um, and help them get better. Uh, but only in situations when it's not feasible to have the human help. Uh, there are other types of disabilities, uh, for example, um, uh, vision disability, hearing disability, movement disability. Uh, I think AI can, can do a lot for those. For example, if we have someone who has a hearing impairment and cannot uh, recognize speech, uh, it should be possible to create an AI device with a little screen that um, listens to things and then transcribes them to words. Uh, uh, that should be much more accurate uh, than lip reading. Uh, it can also be done over the telephone or remotely. Uh, and that little device needs to be intelligent because in a large audience, you need to know who you're talking to. Um, and, and similarly, uh, we have seen, for example, Dr. Stephen Haw the late Dr. Stephen Hawking. Uh, he has many, many disabilities, and we saw that in early stages, he could uh, control uh, movement of the wheelchair and, um, and, and using speech synthesis. But I think in the future, AI can be used to augment the human so that uh, movement, vision, communication, understanding can be much more accurate. Uh, so someone who's visually impaired can also have a seeing description read to the person. So if I could not see anything, I could imagine a hearing input that says, I'm sitting in front of 50 people and uh, uh, the person who's asking the question is a lady in a blue sweater who is a teacher and, um, uh, and other people are very attentive. Or, or they're falling asleep, so it can give me uh, the, the, it can turn visual information into audio, or audio information into visual. Um, and it can also, we can also imagine in the future, there are a lot of robotic work 
uh, that is, uh, for example, um, what's called exoskeleton work that allows you to put on uh, something that allows people who can, cannot walk easily can now walk more safely. People who cannot sit up can now have a rob essentially a robotic vest that pushes you to get up in bed if you have trouble. So I'm very excited about artificial intelligence to deal with um, um, <clears throat> perception or uh, motor movement uh, impairment. Uh, I think the future of the world for people who are physically challenged will be much, much better in about five to 10 years. Um, but coming back to the learning disabilities, to the cognitive issues, to the psychological issues, I think AI can be small tools, but it's still up to the humans to do that. And final point I will make is that um, I really think we need to have more people helping with kids who have uh, cognitive or learning disabilities. And today's uh, public budgets generally cannot do that because people pay taxes and there's only so much money for teachers and teachers are giving lectures, grading exams, grading homework. But if we could keep the budgets the same for education, but let AI do 50% of the teacher's job, then the teacher will have time to become one-on-one -on -one mentors and helping those who have cognitive and learning issues. And, and I think that would be a much better allocation. The teachers will really know at the end of the day that they spend time with someone with a learning disability, they've made a difference that to 10 people every year, as opposed to teachers who are uh, sitting in a, standing in the classroom, giving the same lecture every year, uh, giving homework and marking up the homework repetitively. That's not what teachers ought to be. Teachers ought to be leaders in society who make the biggest difference in the students' lives. And I'm hopeful that AI can take the boring work away from teachers and let teachers do what teachers really um, should do and, and would be more passionate and excited and impactful for doing. Hola, Dr. Lee. Mi nombre es Carlos. Me gustaría preguntarle cómo en un mundo dominado por los algoritmos, ¿dónde queda la emoción? Uh, so artificial intelligence of today is built on machine learning, deep learning, which is optimized by training on data and making decisions. Uh, it really has no self-awareness. Our human emotions are based on our self-awareness that we know about us and we're able to feel. And um, uh, uh, scientifically, it is not very well understood what the human self-awareness and emotions come from. So, uh, in the case of uh, famous case of AlphaGo, de defeating the world champion in Go, uh, we saw the very interesting contrast. Uh, Kejie, who is the world champion, uh, lost the match and in the middle of the game started um, to be frustrated and crying. And you can see that he actually loves the game. And he feels a frustration for himself, who was on top of the world, to now be defeated by a machine. And he also feels, as a Chinese person who's culturally uh, invented the game, and now it's beaten by a British AI. And he also feels um, that, I'm sure he's also questioning, he's devoted his life to this, and should he continue to do that? It's changed his worldview and brought sadness to him. But in contrast, AlphaGo, who won the match, felt no happiness of winning, uh, in fact, does not understand why people play the game, why it's fun. And uh, when, if AlphaGo lost, it would have no emotion, no feeling of defeat, sadness, or frustration. And if AlphaGo won, as it did, it would feel no happiness. Um, and it would have no desire to hug a loved one or feel some kind of accomplishment. In fact, if a human went over to the AlphaGo machine and unplugged it from the wall, that's the end of AlphaGo. So AlphaGo or any AI algorithm of today is merely a computer software. That's no different from Excel. So it's like if you said, uh, I used Excel to compute my company's quarterly p and I push the button, the results come out. Excel, are you happy? No, Excel just is a tool, it did the job. And AlphaGo is no different from, from Excel. Now, having said that, uh, can AI detect emotion? Absolutely. So if we used AI, we put a camera, microphone, and if you allow, 
uh, sensor of um, humidity um, and uh, temperature, heartbeat on you, um, and have the camera be high resolution looking at your pupil dilation, whether you're sweating a little bit, whether your heart is beating fast, AI can very accurately tell if you are happy, sad, nervous, uh, if you're telling the truth or a lie, much, much, much better than humans. So we have to separate this uh, very clearly. So um, AI has no true emotion and no feeling, and it's just like Excel. However, AI can detect human emotion with amazing accuracy and sensitivity. Probably not as good as a good psych psychiatrist, but probably better than most of us in this room. And can AI fake emotion? Well, of course AI can fake emotion. Once it knows your emotion and it can computationally figure out how it should react, you can synthesize a 3D face that is happy or sad or frustrated uh, to the level probably 95% looking quite realistic to a human. So it's a very um, good question and an unusual answer where AI truly feels no human emotion, but it can detect emotion with high accuracy and it can fake emotion with um, uh, medium um, um, uh, fidelity and realism. Buenos días, mi nombre es Alex y me gustaría saber qué trabajos van a ser los más afectados por la inteligencia artificial y sobre todo cuáles son los trabajos del futuro. Okay, um, artificial intelligence, because it's uh, doing single domain optimization, it will um, certainly impact jobs in many different ways. For jobs that are purely routine, repetitive, requiring no creativity or compassion, those jobs are going to be most in danger. Uh, for cognitive jobs, uh, things like um, back office processing of numbers, people who drag and drop spreadsheets and numbers and send, send emails routinely, um, administrative work, assistant work, uh, that is likely to be displaced. Uh, for people who follow simple templates, people in customer service, I get an email, they ask this question, I look at the answer, copy and paste. They call, they ask a question, I find the answer, I read it to them. Those are very routine, those will be replaced. So, um, so jobs that are, particularly these are white collar cognitive work, but they're not really very complex cognitive work. They're work that take uh, five or 10 seconds of thinking and then it gets done and it's within a single domain. So AI can do those. So think about routine repetitive jobs. Uh, jobs that have um, use our perception. So a front, uh, a receptionist, checking if someone who is what they say they are, checking the ID. We already see when we enter many countries, uh, we no longer talk to a human about who looks at us and compare with our passports. Now AI can do that. So for cognitive, hearing, vision-based, AI can do that. Uh, for blue collar work, um, it will depend on whether the job is uh, in the same location, repeating the same task, those will be replaced first. So someone who is examining the size of the shirts, whether the IC board or, or the um, mobile phone has a scratch, those things can be done by AI much better. In fact, detecting a scratch on, a, on an object on the phone is much better done by AI because it's not just using camera, it's using a depth sensor. So if there's a scratch, the depth will change. Humans have a hard time to do that. In fact, humans, uh, their eyes will go bad if they check for scratches every day, so those will be replaced. Uh, some jobs like agriculture will be further automated. Um, in the future, you can have AI robots that plant seeds, uh, that water and fertilize just the right amount. Uh, you can have drones that uh, will, will, will do the seeding, so a lot of that will be automated. In the factory, uh, visual inspection, repet repetitive work uh, on the assembly line, um, and also um, in, the, um, in the warehouses, the logistics for uh, moving boxes around, routing boxes and letters to people, physical objects, logistics, shipping, that will be very much automated. Uh, people who drive forklifts, people who drive the cars to mines and to tourists, especially those not driving on public road, 
those will be gone first. And then drivers, the jobs will be challenged. First, with driving in um, smaller, slower speed, predictable environments like forklifts, mines, and tourist spots. Then with highways. Highways are very dangerous for people to drive, but very safe for AI to drive because the variability is minimal. Then it will drive in uh, cities with um, uh, a very good uh, layout and planning, not so much on small country roads and, and things like that. Um, but gradually, in 15 to 20 years, uh, humans won't drive anymore. So taking that as a job category, that's about 10% of human time. I'm not saying 10% of humans are drivers, but I'm saying 10% of all humans are spent operating some equipment that moves us around. So that will, will be displaced. So the questions to be asked are, uh, is a job routine, repetitive, uh, in, in fixed environments? If they are, then they're in significant danger. Uh, there are many jobs that are enhanced by AI. For example, a doctor can use AI to improve the diagnosis thereby helping to treat the patient. And the doctor would spend more time interacting with the patient, comforting the patient, giving the patient confidence that he or she will re re recuperate. Um, the, the, the jobs of a scientist will be augmented by AI tools that helps discover more discoveries, more drugs, and things like that. So AI will also help many jobs. And then you ask about whether AI will create new jobs. Um, absolutely, AI will create new jobs. If we look at a 30-year horizon, AI will probably create more jobs than it destroys. Um, however, there are several problems to that. The first problem is the jobs AI create will tend to be non-routine, non-repetitive, because if it were routine, repetitive, AI would just do it. So the jobs AI creates will tend to require some kind of education or training, not something someone can just go and do. Um, secondly, uh, we don't know what those jobs are. We know some, but we largely don't know. So you could say, Dr. Lee, you call yourself an expert and you don't know what jobs AI will create. Uh, that is true. Just like 20 years ago, if I sat here and you said, Dr. Lee, you, know, you, you call yourself an internet expert. Can you tell us what jobs internet will create? I couldn't. Um, I, there's no way I could predict that today there are tens of millions of Uber and DD drivers because internet was created, right? Because without internet, there would be no Uber. But 20 years ago, one could not predict how Uber would came about. So the ability to predict what new jobs needs to be updated every year. So I have no doubt AI will create a lot of jobs, but they will, be, uh, they will take a long time for us to know what they are. They probably won't happen in the next five years, and they'll probably be, be very skilled jobs. So um, in terms of, um, people who are in various jobs today. If you're in a routine job that requires no compassion or human to human touch, then that's an endangered area. You need to rethink about retraining into a job that uh, will not be displaced in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and if you're in a job that requires considerable thinking, creativity, strategy, or human-to-human -human touch, then your job is safe, but be thinking about how AI can help your job. Um, and, um, and if you're very young, a student in school, um, there cannot, I cannot give you, these are the 10 jobs that will be big because of AI. Um, but what I can tell you is, first, you have to hone your skills in creativity, strategic thinking, complex issues, and planning. Stay away from the routine work. And also think more about the human touch, how to win trust, how to communicate, how to work within a team. Those will be uh, skills that will uh, be useful forever. Uh, I can also suggest that you should learn a little bit about AI, learn a little bit about programming, learn a little bit for your area of expertise, whether you're studying in journalism or accounting, uh, how to use AI to make your job uh, better. It's, AI is really a tool. Today, we cannot imagine a journalist who doesn't use Microsoft Word. We cannot imagine a um, um, uh, advertising executive who doesn't use PowerPoint or some presentation tool. We cannot imagine a photographer who doesn't use uh, Photoshop. 
See, AI is just another tool like that. So for various professions, learn about where AI can help you, see where those tools will come from, learn to use them, um, and I think um, these will fortify you and better prepare you for the uh, era of AI. Hola, Dr. Lee. Eh, mi nombre es César y me gustaría saber más sobre el trabajo que ha realizado sobre el sistema de reconocimiento de voz en el que es usted pionero. ¿Podría explicarnos cómo lo inventó y qué, qué le llevó a ello? Uh, certainly. Uh, back when I started on voice recognition, it was in 1983, and um, I was faced with all the things I could do in artificial intelligence. But back then, the computers were very, very, very slow. The storage is very, very expensive. So I look at things like computer vision and video. There's no way I could do that because I couldn't even store a segment of one hour of video on my computer. Um, but for voice, it's, I felt it was a smaller problem that I could work on and, uh, and actually build some useful results. So I actually used machine learning. It was a very... Um, heretical at the time. Uh, people didn't believe in machine learning. They believed that uh, computers should be programmed like the human thinking. So here's what an ah sounds like. Here's what an e sounds like. Here's a noun. Here's a verb. So, so the primary approach in the 1980s was to program human language and speech to teach computers the same way. And that was a complete failure. Uh, I was one of the few people who said, why should computers think the way people do? Why don't we just show it a lot of data and have it learn? So, um, so my PhD thesis completed in 1988 was the first speech recognition system that could recognize speech from uh, any person spoken naturally and continuously with, at the time, the world's best accuracy. Um, so I was uh, very proud of the work. It was covered by New York Times, viewed as a breakthrough. Then I went to Apple when we built it into the Apple computer. And then we discovered it really didn't work. Um, what works well in the laboratory when you go into a real live environment is very, very different. Um, we recorded very, uh, uh, very high quality speech in a noise free environment. But once when you enter the real world, the noises become a huge problem. And also, uh, in the laboratory condition, we could spend uh, one hour processing one sentence. But in the real world, you need to have an answer within a few hundred milliseconds of the sentence being spoken. So all of those things presented challenges. We did what we could at the time in 1993, was when we built a system and launched it for Apple users. I was working at Apple. Uh, it was the best product at the time, but it really was not good enough. So it didn't gain mainstream acceptance. Uh, fortunately, Apple continued to work on it. So today, there's Siri, which you can use. Uh, that's managed by my former team. Um, and um, there are also very good uh, speech products from other companies. So I felt that I've made a small contribution to the field. And um, we probably more through um, the product not being successful, giving us the realization we need to take a longer term view, we need to collect more data, we need to have more powerful algorithms. So it was around um, um, six, seven years ago when deep learning began to work for computer vision. And that was when the people in speech said, let's throw away Kai-Fu Lee's research and let's use deep learning. And that was a big step forward. So now my, my algorithms I invented are being thrown out and they're putting in deep learning. And people are seeing the same jumps in performance. So uh, speech, uh, when connected with language understanding and machine translation, I think in the next two to three years, we'll have products that will really open our eyes and say, wow, this is amazing. Uh, today, speech recognition is about at the level of top 10% of people. So, so if, if you put me and people like me in a room, we listen to speech, we write the words, uh, we generally, generally AI can beat us. But I think in three years time frame, we can have it better than all humans uh, in speech recognition, uh, as well as in natural language um, uh, translation from languages. 
So in three years, when I come to this um, uh, audience again, uh, this little ear set will not have a human uh, translating your question. It will be a machine doing it. And the kinds of applications we can imagine are tremendous. We can imagine in the future, maybe three years from now, uh, uh, computer assistants like Alexa and um, Siri will be much more capable in understanding what we want and doing what we want before we know it. We can also expect machine translation to be very accurate, so I can travel to Spain uh, without having a little pocket translator or an app. Um, the translation will be very accurate, maybe through an ear set uh, like, like this one. We can also imagine the future of customer interaction uh, in terms of sales. There will be very smart salespeople who will say exactly what they need to say to us as customers to get us to buy the products they want. Uh, they'll do so better than humans. Uh, and this is just scratching the surface in the very beginning. Um, so, so we're very, very excited by that. Uh, finally, I want to say that this does not mean the computer will truly understand speech and language the way we do. Uh, AI is still trained on data with input and outputs. Uh, the kind of beautiful language like poetry the kind of deep understanding, like a love letter from a man to a woman or a woman to a man, the kind of um, uh, um, things that require a deep understanding cross domain. For example, jokes and pun and humor, those are very hard. So it's very, very strange that the things that seem hard to people are easy for AI. Uh, for example, transcription, machine translation, you know, there's a new Google technology that can understand 100 languages. You can say any language you want, English comes out. It's one big network, it's amazing. No human can do that. However, when it comes to telling a joke and people laughing, AI cannot do that. So I think we still have a long way to go because after all, uh, natural language is the way humans communicate with each other. And there are thousands of years of history built on our using language to gain understanding and trust. And that aspect uh, and all the intricacies and beauties of languages, uh, that will be very distant from achieving. But I think the commercial applications in the next three years, there will be many, many of them. Hola, Dr. Lee, soy David Vivancos. Mi pregunta es, ¿cómo, ¿cómo ve usted la transición que estamos llevando desde la inteligencia artificial general hacia la superinteligencia? Uh, let me first clarify the terms for people. Uh, generally, there are three levels of AI. One is artificial narrow intelligence, which is within a single domain, such as speech recognition or giving loans or Amazon uh, do a very, very good job. The second level is artificial general intelligence, which means matching human capability in every imaginable way. Then there's super intelligence, which is AI so powerful that it dwarfs human intelligence. So there are many different views in the field, but I think I represent uh, most of the AI experts when I say this. Um, the commercial applications in the next 10 to 15 years will be 99.9% .9 artificial narrow intelligence. That is artificial, even artificial general intelligence will be making improvements but probably cannot reach that state in the next 10 to 15 years. And the reason is this. Uh, if you look at the history of AI development, uh, deep learning has been the biggest breakthrough. It has gotten us very far. It has gotten us to the ANI, natural, uh, narrow intelligence. Uh, but in order to really reach artificial general intelligence, we need to match the human's ability to create, uh, to um, have common sense, to have uh, cross-domain knowledge, to uh, think about strategy and planning, and abs to understand abstract terms, uh, to uh, win trust, have self-awareness, consciousness, and emotion. So I just listed about 10 things that we have no idea how to do, from narrow intelligence to general intelligence, which is good for us humans, because uh, the AI people will need 10 more breakthroughs before they can uh, catch up with humans. And it took 60 years to have one breakthrough, deep learning. The next 10 breakthroughs may be much faster, 
but they're not going to happen in 10 or 15 years. So the next 10 or 15 years, I think the biggest opportunity is the commercialization, the monetization, uh, the pervasiveness of AI in industries. Uh, the biggest challenge will be um, uh, job issues and also some other is technical issues. But uh, AGI will be uh, a little bit longer. Uh, there is, and then beyond 15 years, you'll get a wide different uh, um, response. There will be optimists who think 15 to 25 years, we can see beginnings or maybe even the whole AGI. And there will other, be other people who will say it's more like 100 years. There will be other people who will believe maybe never. And I think, um, I think there's no evidence that any of us can say with confidence, whether it's 15, 25, 100, or never. And some of it, because there's no, not enough history. When you, to make a prediction, you need historical evidence. And right now, the only historical evidence we have is it took us 60 years to have one breakthrough. But it doesn't mean the next 10 breakthroughs will take another 600 years. Um, but we just don't know how long it's gonna take. It's kind of like a thousand years ago, if you ask a scientist, can humans fly? It's a total guess, right? Leonardo da Vinci would have said yes, but it wouldn't have flown the way he thought. There will be people who think it's impossible. They'll be proven wrong. There will be people who are optimistic but have no basis of guessing, but they'll be proven right. But similarly, you could a thousand years ago ask people, will there be perpetual motion? In this case, Leonardo da Vinci would have said yes, and he would have been proven wrong. Um, but other people uh, would say yes or no, but as of today, it looks like that's not going to happen. So it's asking a very speculative question uh, for which is hard to answer. I'm pretty confident in 15 to 25 years, it's going to be very hard to do. Now, what about superintelligence? There, so to explain superintelligence, there is a, there is a theory, uh, and in my opinion, a fantasy, but in their opinion, a theory, that AI has improved so fast that when things improve so fast, we as humans cannot visualize the speed of improvement. That we're, we could wake up one day um, and, and suddenly AI has taken over the world. It's become so good that we humans will become almost useless, that we humans um, will be tolerated to exist. We'll be like ants when AI will be like humans. That's the theory. And the basis, the greatest, um, uh, the, their quote unquote proof is that, look, um, in the last five years, AI improved exponentially. Five years ago, AI could do almost nothing. Now, and then uh, three years ago, it beat people in Go. Then it beat people in uh, StarCraft. Then it beat people in medical exams. Then it beat people in um, radiology. Then it's beating people at an exponential pace. So anything moving at exponential pace means what it can do in one year will be better than what it could do for the last 10. So if that continues, in a couple of years, AI will surpass us and we'll be like ants and AI will be like humans. So the flaw of that argument is that it's using headlines, the exponential growth of headlines as a projection. But in reality, those headlines will reach a, um, uh, they will max, max out, reach an asymptote when um, when we run out of applications of deep learning. All of these so-called headlines are based on one technology breakthrough called deep learning. And we're gonna add, add, add in five or 10 years, we're going to have thousands and tens of thousands of deep learning applications. But unless we have a fundamental breakthrough beyond deep learning, so that we can get to those 10 things I mentioned, like uh, consciousness and um, creativity. Unless we have those 10 breakthroughs, we'll be stuck. So this exponential wave is a, um, is, 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 is a mirage. It's not true. Um, it is just applications are going quickly built on deep learning. It is not an exponential curve that will overtake humans. So I am a strong disbeliever on this so-called projection of superintelligence. Uh, there are smart people who disagree with me, but those smart people tend to not be AI experts. Uh, they tend to be uh, philosophers, um, futurists, uh, economists, physicists, uh, but not AI experts. 
So I think um, when I speak about these three levels, uh, I represent the mainstream in AI experts. Dr. Lee, soy el Dr. Andrew Bea. Yo casi diría que la inteligencia artificial es todo aquello que no funciona. ¿Por qué? Cuando teníamos el reconocimiento de matrículas de los coches, eso ya antes era inteligencia artificial, ahora ya es algo que damos por, por hecho. ¿no? El reconocimiento de la traducción automática del lenguaje, antes era magia, ahora es algo que tenemos el día a día. Ya hemos dejado de ser inteligencia artificial. Por tanto, inteligencia artificial, ¿usted cree que es todo aquello que no funciona? Everything didn't work stayed in AI. Uh, however, that view I think is changing. Now, because AI is such a hot term, everybody's calling everything AI, which I think is also very dangerous. Uh, so, to explain to people who are not so familiar with AI, I would describe that the AI that works today is called machine learning or deep learning. Uh, what it does is, within a single domain, with a large amount of data, can make very excellent decisions, even better than people, but they still lack the human capabilities of uh, creativity um, and, uh, and the feelings. That's the short description. And I think that largely covers the next 15 years or so, the types of um, applications of AI, from machine learning to business, to perception, to autonomous vehicles. Um, and um, um, for most people, the, there are a, a several uh, ways in which they misunderstand AI. And um, uh, we've covered many of them in the questions, but uh, to summarize, I would say, the first, first misunderstanding is AI is like science fiction. Um, and we need to explain that science fiction is creative, imaginative, but not so realistic yet, that it would take a long time, if ever, to achieve the kind of um, sentient, creative, uh, compassionate, uh, human-like uh, AGI or um, super intelligent beings like we see science fiction. So don't believe that. The second misunderstanding is that um, AI is still very long-term and um, uh, takes a long time and it's not, I don't see any AI around us. But to those people, I, I would explain that every time you go on an application app, mobile app or a website, you're probably using AI. Google, Amazon, Facebook, and any, any website or app with a large amount of content, they have AI in them already. So AI is here. AI is in a lot of internet and business applications already. And I would uh, want to explain that. Um, and then I think the third uh, area of um, um, concerns about AI, which is rising, is that AI is bad because AI is um, uh, taking away jobs and uh, AI is um, giving us um, content that's uh, fake news. And AI is targeting each person and making us worse people. So for each of those, I would need to uh, further explain that AI may be taking away some routine jobs in the next 15 years, but those were never the jobs that we humans want to do or were destined to do. So we need to strive to be better humans. AI is pushing us to be better humans. Um, to the concerns about the AI causing um, issues with privacy uh, bias or security, uh, I would hope people will uh, continue to trust that te new technologies always have problems. Give us some time. We can overcome those problems and, uh, and, and we should work hard and, and, and show, show progress. Um, that is a generally concerning area because in the United States, uh, if you ask people, is AI good or bad? We have now crossed the 50% mark where more than 50% of the people will say AI is more bad than good. Um, I think that is a very unfortunate um, result of um, some poor behavior by companies, uh, some misuse of AI, but also media sensationalism. Um, I think it is not really giving technology the proper credit. Uh, every technology is neutral. And if we believe human nature is more good than bad, then there will be more positive uses than negative uses. Just like electricity is 
has many, many great uses, but also some bad uses. The internet has many, many great uses, but also some bad uses. So I think we need to uh, um, not spend so much time blaming the technology. Anything that has happened that is bad with AI is caused by people who use it not for benevolent but for malevolent reasons. We need regulations to punish those people. We need tools to help people, help developers build better AI applications. Uh, we need advocacy for consumers. We need to point out when AI is not doing something good. But I don't think it's fair to um, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater, that when we see something that is not good, uh, blame it all on the technology and not use it. We have to keep in mind that um, while there may be some issues with Google, Facebook, or Amazon, these are the applications that make our lives uh, more productive, efficient, and more fun. And if we, if we throw out all the AI, then all those applications stop working. So I hope people can keep a constructive view and give AI and AI technologists a chance. I think in five years, a lot of the problems we talk about will be much, much, much better and that uh, AI really will eventually be recognized, like electricity and the internet, as something that brings about positive change, um, not because AI itself is, is, um, is uh, positive, but AI is a technology that human nature is generally good. We will generally do more good things than bad. We will catch and fix the problems with AI, and it will be just as positive and powerful as the electricity and internet. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure and uh, a lot of really great questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks.